this is an IPython notebook in um, VS Code. And so hopefully this will work. It's my first time trying that out. So we'll find out. Um, and let me know if that quiz working or anything. Uh, but this chapter was on object-oriented programming. Um, and this section introduces the class statement and the idea of creating new objects. Um, object-oriented programming is a programming technique where code is organized as a collection of objects. An object consists of data, attributes, behavior, methods, which are functions applied to the object. Um, we've already been using some of it during this course. So for example, manipulating a list, and you see that here where we had a list, we appended an item, then inserted, and then when you look at it, you can see all the changes. And so in this case, nums is an instance of a list, and the methods append and insert are attached to the instance, which was nums. The class statement. Um, in, in Python, we use a class statement to define a new object. And so in this example, you can see that we create a player class um, that's got an init for initialize, move, and damage methods. Uh, in a nutshell, a class is set of functions that carry various operations on so-called instances. Um, and an instance are the actual objects that you manipulate in your program. They are created by calling the class as a function. So here we have an object A that's a player with two, three. I think that's the location. Um, and then player B has 10, 20. So A and B are instances of player. Um, the class statement is just a definition. It doesn't do anything by itself, uh, similar to a function definition. So here for each instance has its own local data. And so for A, we see it has two for its x value and B has 10, which is what we put into the function calls. Um, <clears throat> the data is initialized by the underscore underscore init underscore underscore parentheses. Um, so is the init function. And for here, that doesn't evaluate anything, but I still went ahead and ran it. Um, you can see it for the player. Uh, there are no restrictions. Uh, say that again. It was an echo. Oh, okay. Um, oh, there are yeah, no restrictions. Um, just want to say that underscore underscore method, I call dunder method. Um, from the name underscore underscore. So in Python, this method I call gender method. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't, didn't think I knew that. Um, there are no restrictions on the total number or type of attributes stored. Um, and then instant methods are functions applied to instances of an object. And so for here, it's got the move method for the player class. Um, uh, I have a question. So um, why do we always you, I mean, why sub, um, what is the rationale of using sub? Can we use any other word like uh, anything? Um, why do we prefer to use sub, self, self um, at the first argument always? Um, actually that's uh, in the next section. Uh, Oh, we okay. down here. So, uh, yeah, by convention, the instance is called self. Uh, however, the actual name used is unimportant. Uh, the object is always passed as a first argument. So it's whatever you put at the beginning and is merely Python program style to call this argument self. OK, OK. Well, but that's a good question. Um, and you can see that here when you put it into the functions. Uh, classes do not have a defined scope of names. Uh, and so for in this example, the move will call a global function that will be outside of this class, but self.move will call the move function within the class. Uh, so if you want to operate on an instance, you always refer to it explicitly um, using self or whatever. Uh, like we just talked about where you put in first. 
Yeah, I think that's it for that. that. Yeah, so the no this one is a no cost to global more function. Um this more function um is calling the function from not inside the class, right? From the um global um global environment, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, this yeah. first line would, the second line would call this one right here. Ah, okay. Um, this, uh, your quattro works, um, eval equals uh, false, uh, mine doesn't work. Um, <laughs> when I try this, uh, uh, yeah, eval false. I didn't know why, but I tried. The other time when I tried, um, this thing didn't work, yeah. Uh, so the way I set this up was uh, I uh -oh. use, Porto as a regular document. I'll show you right here because we're going to move documents to see the exercises. Um, is that I had it in its own file, and then I used the convert terminal command to make it into an IPython notebook. And I, that yeah. might be the catch, but I honestly don't know. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Thank you. So now we can look at the exercises. <clears throat> um, for this set, we're going to uh, start with the files from the previous sections. Um, and so I just used the solutions. I felt like that'd be easier instead of what I had previously. And then these first uh, couple cells are those actual files. Um, that get run to set it up. And so I hope that made sense to everyone. Um, I'm not really sure a great way to set up that situation. Um, but for exercise 4.1, objects as data structures. Um, in the previous sections, we worked with data represented as tuples and dictionaries. Uh, so for example, the holding of stock could be represented in a tuple like this or in a dictionary like this. Um, and you can even write functions for manipulating such data um, like these. Uh, however, um, as your program gets larger, you might want to create a better sense of organization. Thus, another approach for representing data would be to define a class. Um, so in the instructions say to do it as another file, but I kept it in a uh, cell. And so it this worked fine for me. And this is how I just started. Yeah. So um and previously, like they say, like uh, with functions, we make our program somehow modular, right? But class go a bit higher to make everything more modularized. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and so here you have our stock class with name, shares, and price. Um, and we get to test out this example where we create a stock instance uh, with the name, shares, price, and then we can print each of them to see all the values. Um, can we have a class without init method? Um, I think you're going to need a oh, without an init method. Um, I think you can like technically code one up. I don't think it will do anything. But I guess if you wanted to, well, I can't remember, I might be wrong with this, but we might see an example of that when we get to the inheritance section. Um, we'll look back at that later. Okay. But that would be the only time it, you would have to have a weird or not weird, but you wouldn't have a super common programming construction to get that. But I guess, well, I guess if you, well, no, because you need the self. So I think you do need one. Um, we'll look back in a second for the, when you get to inheritance, because there might be an example. I'll try to remember to call that out. Um, and then we create a few more stock objects and manipulate them. And we see that here in these examples, where we have stock B and C. And then this just runs 
through and gets the values, shows where they are in memory, um, and then the information for printing. Cool. And one thing to emphasize here is that the class stock acts like a factory for creating instances of objects. Uh, basically, you call it as a function and it creates a new object for you. Um, it must be emphasized that each object is distinct. They each have their own data and that's separate from the other objects that have been created. An object defined by a class is somewhat similar to a dictionary, just with somewhat different syntax. Uh, so for example, instead of uh, using the bracket notation with the labels, you would just use the instance dot uh, variable that you're trying to find. So um, in exercise 4.2, we'll add some methods uh, which classes, you can attach functions to your objects. These are known as methods and our functions operate on the data stored inside an object. And so we're going to add a cost and a sell method to the stock object. And that's what we got here, where the cost just returns the shares multiplied by the price. <clears throat> and then sell just reduces the shares um, by the number by our n underscore shares. And so we can try that out here. And we see the result where we set up a stock, we see the cost, we see the shares, and we sell 25, and then we can see it change by the appropriate amount. And then we can create a list of stock instances from a list of dictionaries, then compute the, co the total cost. Um, and so this uses code that we had in the previous files to parse the CSV, set everything up. And then we just uh, run through it. And so that this is a neat line right here where it's the sum of the cost for S and portfolio. Uh, so that's a slick way to do that. And then we're going to modify the read portfolio function in the report program up top uh, so that reads a portfolio into a list of SOC instances. Uh, just since the previous exercise. And once we've done that, we'll fix all the code in the other sets so that works with stock instances instead of dictionaries. Um, and that's pretty much, you mainly just change the bracket notation to the dot notation. Um, and that's kind of what this does like right here, the stock cost. Um, the s dot name s dot shares, and then if we run it, we'll read in those same files and it prints it out nicely. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, then we Hi, can... Isabel. Welcome, Isabel has arrived. Hello. Hello. Hi. We have already started, but we are happy you join us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> uh, that's totally fine. Um, but we're now moving on to uh, chap or chapter four, section two, which is on inheritance. I think that's right. Yep. <clears throat> Um, so inheritance is a commonly used tool for writing extensible programs, and this section explores that idea. Um, inheritance is used to specialize existing objects. And so the setup is you'll have a class, that's a parent class, and then when you want the child that extends it, the uh, syntax will be class, child name, parentheses, parent, close parentheses. Um, so the new class child is called a derived class or subclass. The parent class is known as a base class or super class. Uh, parent is specified in parentheses after the class name. So it's like I just said with the class, child, and then parentheses, parent, parentheses. Uh, with inheritance, you are taking an existing class and you're adding new methods, redefining some of the existing methods, or adding new attributes to instances. In the in your extending existing code. Uh, so let's work through an example where we have our stock class 
from before, and that's pretty much the exact same. And so we can change any part of this via inheritance where we create a new my stock class that inherits from the stock base class uh, with the new method called panic, um, where it sells all the shares. And so we can see this in action here where we create a new my stock class sell. You can see the difference. I mean, you can panic and it sells all of them. And so we drop from 125 for sale. And then for panic, we drop all the way down to zero. Um, and then we can also redefine an existing method. And so here we kind of write over the cost function where instead of shares times price, multiply all that by 1.25. And then we see that here where it's a little more, well, I guess that's 1.25 times these two numbers put together. So that's a neat way to override a method if you want a very similar class. Uh, the new method takes the place of the old one. The other methods are unaffected. And he says it's tremendous. Um, sometimes a class extends an existing method, but it wants to use the original implementation inside the redefinition for this, we use super. Um, and so you see that here. And you use to call the previous version. And so then this part, super parentheses dot method, we'll call the cost in the cost function in the parent class. Um, so you can call back up higher. Um, and then there's where a caution in Python 2, the syntax was more verbose, um, but I don't think anyone's using Python 2. So I think we're good there. So here we have init and inheritance. If init is redefined, it is essential to initialize the parent. Um, and so you can see this here uh, where we have our stock class and then the my stock class, we use the super dot in it to initialize the parent class. And then we can add the factor attribute. Um, and then that can be used as a variable for our new cost function that overrides the previous cost function. Uh, so that was a little confusing. I hope everyone caught that. Um, you should call the init method on the super, which is the way to call the previous version as shown previously. And then using inheritance, uh, it is sometimes used to organize related objects. And so in this example, we have our shape class and then circle and rectangle extend shape through inheritance. And so you can think of a logical hierarchy or taxonomy. However, a more common and practical usage is related to making reusable or extensible code. For example, a framework might define a base class and instruct you to customize it. And you see that here where custom handler is extending TCP handler. The base class contains some general purpose code, your class inheritance and customize specific parts. Um, the is a relationship. Inheritance establishes a type of relationship. So you can see that here where circle is an instance of shape because it extends up. And so importantly, ideally, any code that worked with instances of the parent class will also work with instances of the child class. So object base class, if a class has no parent, you sometimes see object used as the base. Uh, so class shape object. Uh, object is a parent of all objects in Python. Uh, it's not technically required, but you often see it as a holdover from when it's required use in Python 2. If omitted the class, still implicitly inherits from object. Then you can also have multiple inheritance where you can inherit from multiple classes. So, I have a question. So um, the way we define our class, uh, the parent class, we don't put object, right? It is when we have inheritance that we put, uh, put the bracket in the child class. So what will happen now if in the parent class, we open the, uh, uh, we put object inside, what will happen? Do you understand my question? Um, yeah, if you go uh, no. a little bit, 
can you go a little bit up up for example um okay um so we have a class shape here yeah. can we open the bracket and write object inside because uh, oh yeah uh, like this yes yes so yeah so um because they say the object is the what is the english layer they say is the um is the okay. base if a class has no parent you sometimes see object used as a base all right so i think because um by default base class is of type of object because everything is object so we need not to put this but um, i think the point they want they are driving maybe in python 2 um, people write it there for the share yeah that's what i think it's mostly a holdover um and i'm guessing there might be situations where you have like a higher level method that creates classes and you need to put something in there and you put object uh, that'd be a weird situation, but I could see that happening. Oh, they even put it here, right? Um, plus uh, shape object. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, yeah, I think we're back at the end with the class of child inheritance features from both parents. There are some rather tricky details. It says not to do it unless you know what you're doing. Um, some further information will be given in the next section, but we're not going to utilize multiple inheritance further in this course, uh, which I've never seen any of the code I've worked with, but I don't work with a ton of object oriented programming anyways. So now we can move on to the exercises. Um, a major use of inheritance is in writing code that's meant to extend or customize in various ways, especially in libraries or frameworks. Uh, to illustrate, consider the print report function in your report program. It should look something like this. Uh, that's all it looks like. And then I'm going to run through these. This big file just sets up all those um, previous homework files. And we can see it working. So for the first exercise, uh, suppose we want to modify the print report function to support a variety of different output formats, such as plain text, HTML, CSV, or XML. To do this, you could try to write one gigantic function that did everything. However, doing so would likely lead to an unattainable mess. Instead, this is a perfect opportunity to use inheritance instead. Um, to start, focus on the steps that are involved in creating a table at the top. Of the table is a set of table headers. After that, rows of table that appear. Let's take those steps and put them into their own class. So we'll create a file. And here I'm just keeping a cell called table format and define the following class. And then uh, this is the example that I was thinking of when you previously asked if you could have a class without an init function. And here we do have an example of that where this class doesn't initialize anything. It still uses a self, but there's not a method for it. Um, this class does nothing but serves as kind of a design specification for additional classes that will be defined shortly. A class like this is sometimes called an abstract base class. <clears throat> and then we're going to modify their print report function so it accepts a table formatter object, uh, which we just created up here, as input and invokes method on it to produce the output, uh, for example, like this. And so you can see that it up here, the new function has this new parameter and it's used for the headings and then for the different rows. So if we run this code, um, it gives us an error and it should immediately crash with a not implemented error exception, which is what it does. And I know when I was working through this, I got annoyed because I did not read this line after trying to debug this. Um, but it's not too exciting and it's exactly what we expected and we continue to the next part. So exercise 4.6, using inheritance to produce different outputs. 
Uh, the tail formatter class you defined in part A is meant to be extended via inheritance. In fact, that's the whole idea. To illustrate, define a class text table formatter like this. So we define this class. And then we modify the report. All right, we modify the portfolio underscore report function like this, um, where it's these last lines right here where we take in the text table formatter class that we just created up here as a formatter. And then we use the print report function that we had up here to use a formatter to print the report. So it should produce the same output as before, which it does. So that's looking good. <clears throat> However, let's change output to something else. Define a new class CSV table formatter that produces output in CSV format. And so it's pretty much the exact same code as the text table formatter um, where we're extending the table formatter, but instead of using uh, just the spaces and that type of formatting, we're using uh, commas. And then we made the same change down here where we use the CSV table formatter. And then we can print it out and it prints out using commas. And then the actual exercise for this part is using a similar idea, defining a class HTML table formatter that produces table with the following outputs where it uses the HTML code to get the table rows and table data, which is uh, very similar. You just need to kind of fill in with the table rows, table data. Um, and then when you run it on the sign right here, we can get the output. <clears throat> and then in exercise 4.7, we have polymorphism in action. A major feature of object-aware programming is that you can plug an object into a program and it'll work without having to change any of the existing code. Uh, for example, if you wrote a program that extends to use table formatter object, it would work no matter what kind of table formatter you actually gave it. Uh, this behavior is sometimes referred to as polymorphism. One, pot one potential problem is figuring out how to allow a user to pick out the formatter that they want. Direct this use of the class name, such as text table formatter, is often annoying. Uh, thus, you might want to consider some simplified approach. Perhaps you embed an if statement into the code like this. And so here we can just, you flip between the different formats we already created by your keyword or variable for TXT for text, CSC for CSV and HTML for HTML. And this now that you'll get a runtime error. Uh, in this code, the user specifies a uh, simplified name as TXT or CSV to pick a format. Uh, however, is putting a big if statement in the portfolio report function like that the best idea? It might be better to move that code to a general purpose function somewhere else. In the table format file, add a function create formatter name that allows a user to create a formatter given an output name such as TXT, CSV, or HTML, and will modify their portfolio report so it looks like this. So we create a function that basically keeps the if else logic all wrapped up. And then we modify their portfolio report to take in the format style and it'll uh, pass it there for the create formatter. And then if we run it with all the different options, you get each of the respective outputs. So writing sensible code is one of the most common uses of inheritance in libraries and frameworks. For example, a framework might instruct you to define your own object that inherits from a provided base class. You're then told to fill in various methods to implement various bits of functionality. Another somewhat deeper concept is the idea of owning your abstractions. In the exercises, we defined our own class for formatting table. You may look at your code and tell yourself, I should just use a formatting library or something that someone else already has made instead. No, you should use both your class and a library. Using your own classes promotes loose coupling and it's more flexible as long as your application uses the programming 
interface of your class, you can change the internal implementation to work in any way that you want. You can write all custom code. You can use someone else's third party package. You can swap out one third party package for a different package when you find a better one. It doesn't matter. None of your application code will break as long as you preserve, keep the interface. That's a powerful idea. And it's one of the reasons why you might consider inheritance for something like this. Um, that said, design object oriented programming can be extremely difficult. For more information, you should probably look for books on the topic of uh, design patterns. Um, although understanding what happened in this exercise will take you pretty far in terms of using objects in a practically useful way. And all this uh, discussion section, I think the you swap out one third party package for a different package when you find a better one. Um, that's probably the best use case I see here. And I really like that option. Um, but that is it for inheritance. And we can move on to special methods, which is section three. So uh, for here, we have various parts of Python's behavior can be customized via special or so-called magic methods. Uh, the This section introduces the idea in a in addition, dynamic attribute access and bound methods are discussed. Um, <clears throat> classes may define special methods. These have special meaning to the Python interpreter. They are always preceded and followed by uh, the double underscore, uh, for example, in init. So here we have init and repar. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. So if anyone knows that these should be pronounced differently, uh, just let me know. Uh, there are dozens of special methods, but we will only look at a few specific examples. <clears throat> special methods for string conversions. Objects have two string representations. And so here, from date time, we import date, and then you can print it, and then just view the object, and when it's nicely, and then one has whole function spot out for you. The string functions use to create a nice printable output, uh, which we see here. And the wrapper function is used to create a more detailed representation for programmers, um, which are prints out basically the code that makes it. Those functions use a pair of special methods in the class to produce the string to be displayed. <clears throat> and so here, if we create our own date class, um, you can use the two functions, uh, string, or I guess str, where you print it out nicely, and then wrapper, where you print out the date at the beginning, which is the class name. And so the note here is the convention for wrapper is to return a string that when fed to eval will recreate the underlying object. If that's not possible, some kind of easily readable representation is used instead. And so that works if you fed um, this line or this line into eval, it'll return the data object that you want. <clears throat> and then we have special methods for mathematics. The mathematical operators involve call to the following methods. Um, we have add, sub, mult, and, and so on. And then you also have special methods for item. Yeah, I have a question. So okay. no? when we basically do addition under the whole this is what is happening right using the special method that we don't know right yes i think that's yes, right and i know you can override this if you have specific ways you want to add classes together like if you had um different objects that are like people and you want to add them or something um which is pretty cool when I've seen that used or weird like spaces and mathematics. Um, but for the most part, yes. It, yeah, it is calling this function, like you asked. Uh, then we have the special methods for item access. These are methods to implement containers. Um, so len for length, get item set item, delete item. And you can use them in your classes, we have the getters and setters pretty much. <clears throat> uh, then we have method invocation. 
invoking a method is a two-step process. You have the lookup, which is the decimal, and then the method call, which is the parentheses. And so here with the decimal, sorry, um, you had the lookup, and then here with the parentheses, you had the method call. Um, and so, um, um, I have a question. So, what is this lookup doing? So, I can see we create an object called cat, and we call cost. Cost is a function, right? Uh, it's a method, yes. right? So, yep. um. We call a method with, um, so I, I, I'm not sure if I really understand what the lookup here. What the, this uh, S dot cost without bracket with only dot, what is the meaning of lookup? What are we doing here? Um, this right here is just saving the cost function of this class on this instance. And that's what you see printed out right here. Um, it's the method stock.cost of this object. And so it's not really any useful as far as I know. Um, and you'll probably just use the parentheses on it to print your actual output. Um, okay, but hold on. Uh, we're covering this next section and now come back to this because uh, this talks about bound methods and it's a method that is not yet been invoked by the function call operator. Um, and it's known as a bound method. It operates on the instance where it originated. And so that's kind of what you have when you have just the decimal place without the parentheses. Um, and it's often a source. Yeah, so you mean the lookup is the bound method or what? What is the bound yes. method here? Yep. Yeah, it's just okay. um, when you haven't actually ask Python to run the logic. Um, so you haven't hit the parentheses yet. And so it saves all the information, but it doesn't actually operate. <clears throat> and it is often a source of careless, non-obvious errors, which you can see here, because we were missing the parentheses right here, which I think you can run it. And there we go, it actually works. Um, or devious behavior that's hard to debug. And so you'll see that here, instead of having the methods you want. Actually, oh, this doesn't do anything because of the decimals. Um, and we did the find file name. Uh, in both these cases, the error is caused by forgetting to include the train parentheses um, for these two. And so I think it's not really like a useful concept, like you're not going to purposely code anything as a bound method and you'll always have the parentheses. This is more of giving you a really common error that you'll see. And so when you see the error message about bound methods, that's what you want. Hopefully that made a little bit more sense. Um, as we access, there is an alternative way to access, manipulate, and manage attributes. <clears throat> and so, for example, you can ha use the has attribute and get attribute. Oh, except I don't have, or this is eval equals false, so it's not even supposed to be working. Um, and so, th these are just like your normal getters and setters if you use those in other programming languages. Um, and so, you can also set a useful default value for the argument. Um, and so it'll return something if there's nothing there, which is basically this uh, little set of logic wrapped up nicely into one function call. Uh, so I think these are just an easy way to get set delete and check if an object has an attribute. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense so far. I'm not sure that answers your question about methods because I think it's just a weird topic. Like you don't really need to know it for coding. It's just easy to know it for debugging. And then we can move on to the exercises for this section. So we're going to 
at the better output for printing objects. Uh, so we'll modify the stock object that we defined previously. So the wrapper method produces more useful output. So that's what we have here. Um, and it is these two lines where we do the underscores, wrapper underscores self, and you use the, I think it's called an F string to print out all the information nicely. And so here, if you hit this and you just look at Google, I guess you would say it returns the code that makes that object. And now we can see what happens when you read our portfolio stocks and view their resulting list after you made those changes. Um, then this code just sets everything up. And so now if we print everything out from when we already read in, it prints out all the different code to create all the different stocks. And then for exercise uh, 4.10, an example of using get attribute or get adder. Uh, Gatter is an alternative mechanism for reading attributes. It can be used to write extremely flexible code. Uh, to begin, or try this example where we have a column names. And then for each name in the columns, we print out using get adder all the different options for the stock. So that's a slick way where you don't have to know all this information. You can save each of these separately. And then this line right here will print all the information out for you nicely. But actually, you have to worry about what it actually is. Um, so we can carefully observe that the output data is determined entirely by the attribute names listed in the columns variable. And then here, we file table format, takes that idea and expand it to the generalized function print table that prints a table showing users specify attributes of a list of arbitrary objects. That's what the earlier print report function print table should also accept the table format instance to control the table output. Here's how it should work. And then here we just have that names, shares, and price. Um, and it all works through. So it's not that hard. Um, you just need that in this set right here for the row data. Um, so hopefully that's good. And then we can move on to the last section, uh, which is defining exceptions. And this uh, section was pretty short. We have user defined exceptions are defined by classes. <clears throat> and so there's just an example. Uh, exceptions always inherit from, oh, I'm on the wrong file. Let me open up uh, this one. Um, exceptions always inherit from exception. Usually they are empty classes, use passed for the body. You can also make a hierarchy of your exceptions. So these are just little examples where you can uh, extend the network error class, which is a common exception, but you can specify if you want authentication error or protocol error. And then just need the exercises for the section. Um, so we're defining a custom exception. It is often good practice for libraries to define their own exceptions. This makes it easier to distinguish between Python exceptions uh, that you normally see and uh, raised in response to common programming errors versus exceptions intentionally raised by a library to signal a specific usage problem. And so if we here, we'll modify the create format function from the last exercise so that raises a com a custom format error exception when the user provides a bad format name. Um, and so this was the logic that was if else for txt for text, csv for csv, and then html for html. And at the end, we just print out this one, OECF string for unknown table format, parentheses f. So we'll take in the name for the, uh, not parentheses, sorry, uh, percent sign s. And I'll output that information. And so then a user would know that 
where they put into the name variable um, is unknown and not an option. And then that is pretty much it for this chapter. Um, I like the chapter a lot. I think that object aware programming classes is pretty cool and it's something I don't tend to do with R. I don't really mess around with the S3, S4 stuff. Um, so I find that a lot easier in Python than in R. So I thought it was a cool chapter that really helped shine why this language is a little different and why it would be useful in other situations. Wow. And right. that is okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, one thing I think I, uh, in this book we have not discussed about is related to class is what we call data classes. Um, do you know what is called data classes? Um, a data class? Um, a data class? Yeah. So there's something I, I share a link. Um, the chat. So, for example, um, you see when defining class, we always use self. Um, that self, you know, um, and if you can see, um, maybe you can sh uh, share your screen. Um, just show something and just um, show us an instance of class. I want to see something. So this um, uh, data class actually, um, I think uh, it's a new feature for Python 3. It, it's not available, I think, in Python 3. So you can define um, class a um, better way than the way we do uh, with uh, that self stuff. So maybe we can look it up. Uh, yeah, but the book, uh, the book didn't mention it, but uh, it's something that we can I don't know if anybody uh, knows that and can add more light on the data class. Um, Daniel, Isabel, do you know about the data class? You don't want to add something? I do not, but it's new to me. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time I'm seeing this. Uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's something that means we can check out. Uh, yeah. All right. I think today we. Uh, pretty set. Uh, we finish on time. Uh, yeah, and um, thank you, Taylor, for uh, facilitating this session today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, anyone want to add something or not? Okay. So I think uh, we are good, and we we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tyler. 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 Thank you Tyler.